Is anybody taking a picture? You taking a picture? He goes to Henderson. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed in the sun, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garden of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a, a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. So we covered Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 last time. Um, I think we're at the part where she's standing on the moon, and what does the moon do? It reflects the light of the sun. You know, have you looked at the moon, the telescope, when it's all bright and beautiful and a full moon? It hurts my eyes to look at it through a telescope. It's so bright, right? It's amazing how dirt can reflect light like that. But here we see the moon is reflecting the light of the sun, and I think it's a reference to the Old Testament you know, with the, the, the type, right? And Christ is the anti-type. So we have the type of the symbolic, the ceremonial system. You know, it's kind of a, a shadow of things to come. And Christ is the real. You know, he's the true light. We saw in Malachi how he's, come the, he's called the S-U-N of righteousness, right? And so I think we have an allusion there to you have this uh, church, this woman, you know, we established last time that a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. And she's standing on the moon. So we have a church in the Old Testament and a church in the New Testament. It's the same church. You know, God's people described as being clothed in Christ's righteousness. And we talked a little bit about that last time. <clears throat> Where in the Bible can we show that God's people in the Old Testament were called the church? Did you say Acts chapter 7? Did I hear that? Acts chapter Acts, 7. Acts chapter 7. Yeah? Okay. I think it came. Okay. Acts 7. Notice what it says there in verse 38. We're going to have to read this in the King James Version, Scott. Because it, it gives us a, a different translation than a newer, the newer translations. So what's it say? You hear that, Scott? Acts seven thirty-eight. Mm -hmm. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So Stephen is talking about the history of Israel there, and he's referring to the time when they were delivered from Egypt and were at Mount Sinai. So we're in the Old Testament times here, and what does he call God's collective people at that time? The church, the church right? What are some of the newer translations called? Congregation. Congregation, right? The word is ekklesia. The Greek word is ekklesia, and ekklesia means called out ones, right? So when you have been called out of the world to join Christ's kingdom, we're talking about that is the church. Right? We're not talking denomination. We're talking people who are called out of the world, out of Satan's kingdom, into Christ's kingdom. If you're called out of the world, you've accepted the call, and you're part of Christ's kingdom, and you're included in the church. Okay? And that is described symbolically in Revelation chapter 12 as this woman. Alright? And notice in verse 2, what does it say about her there? You know, it's interesting how we have this idea of God's people collectively called the church or in, in the Bible, a woman, uh, being in travail or being with child and giving birth. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 26 and uh, look at verse 17 and 18. Now, in this particular case, now Isaiah lived about 700 years, a little more than 700 years before the time of Jesus. And he's talking about his people 
God's chosen people, God's called out ones, right? And unfortunately, they have failed, and he's addressing their failure here in Isaiah chapter 26. Notice what it says there in verses 17 and 18. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain, and crieth out in her pains, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. So, you can see in multiple places in the Old Testament, and I think John is kind of pulling from that here in the book of Revelation, this idea how the church is in uh, childbirth pains, right? Travail, it may say in some of the older translations. And uh, notice how Isaiah is bringing this up and says, you know, it looks like you're, you're pregnant with a, with a baby and you're in childbirth pain, but you Nothing's come out. He says, what does it say you just brought word forth wind? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Now, that'd be a bad situation, yeah, right? Yeah, that'd be real bad. Now, so what he's saying is, here you claim to be God's people, but you're not fruitful. You're not sharing the gospel. You know, he's called the gospel prophet of the Old Testament, Isaiah, right? And so you're not <laughs> sharing the gospel. There's no fruit in your life. Are you really connected to Christ? Are you connected to the Messiah? Are you connected to the Creator? Because his focus was worship the Creator. If you notice in Isaiah's writings, he says that over and over and over. Focuses on worshiping the Creator. And I think we can ask ourselves the same thing today. Yeah? If you're connected to Christ, right, you're going to be fruitful. If you're not connected to Christ, it's a bad situation. So I think it's a good opportunity to say, I want to be connected to Christ. How about you? Right? And the way to do that is ask Him into your life. Right? How do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? You ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. You know, how do we experience salvation? We're saved by grace through faith. Right? That's what Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says. Not of ourselves. It's not of works. Okay? And so, whenever you experience that connection to Christ, guess what, Mike? You want to go out and share, right? You want to say, hey, Don, this is great news. Come on, man, let me share this with you. You're going to be on fire. And you know, Don says, oh, let me see what you got, right? And then when Don gets a hold of it, it's like, wow, this is cool. And we want to go share with others, right? I mean, that's the natural. It's not this, oh, i got to go out and get off tracks, you know, i got to go out and share the gospel. <laughs> we don't want to be like that, do we? It's good news. It's good news. Matter of fact, it's better than good news, isn't it? It's great news. Right? It really is. It's really great news. You know, when we come to know God's character, it's better than what we can even imagine. Right? It's, it's transforming in our lives. A desire. That's why she, the book's called The Desire of Ages. Right? The Desire of Ages. Now, so, Pastor, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, if let's I do had it. a diadem on my head, what would I look like? <laughs> if you had a what? A diadem or whatever this is. That'd be a crown. Uh, okay, so, where do you see diadem in the text? Uh, di uh, and they had seven diadems on their head. See, you, you're jumping ahead to verse 3, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> Are we not there yet? Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, sorry about that. I, we can do a little recapitulation. Yeah, we'll do, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll get to that when we get there. <laughs> okay, but I really believe that Revelation chapter 12, verse 2 is talking about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I want you to see... Now, this idea of a woman representing the church goes all the way back to the garden. Who's the original woman? Okay, guys, can you imagine you're Adam, you go to sleep, a little anesthesia, God takes out a rib, you wake up, and what do you see? The most beautiful sight that Adam has ever seen. Whoa, man. Right? 
I mean, right, guys? Women are the pinnacle of creation, right? You know? Isn't that right, ladies? The pinnacle. Right? There's nothing more beautiful than God has created. And so, I think it's talking about this allusion to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Notice um, the prophecy there about the Messiah in Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What's he talking about there? Christ succeeding the race. Yeah, so from the woman comes Christ, right? And Christ is going to, in this word, you know, I don't like it how it says, he, he shall bruise your head. Yeah. The, the word, the word is crush. You know, crush his head. <clears throat> you, how many of you have seen The Passion, that movie, you know? The, yeah, I've seen it, sir. You know, you, I thought that was, you know, how he took and stomped on the head of the snake there in the garden. You, know? you remember that? And so, and that's what I think he's talking about here. And then it says, the snake shall bruise his heel, right? So he's going to crush his head, but in the process, he's going to be hurt. But it's talking about Christ here, and I think this is an allusion to that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, that we're talking about uh, the Messiah coming forth from the woman or coming forth from the church, and we see that here in Revelation chapter 12 as we go forward. So we have a little parenthetical statement here about um, the war in heaven, right? Verse 3. And verse 3 as Mark was asking about, and another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. How do we know? Verse 9. Verse 9. Thank you, Scott. So, verse 9 tells us who the dragon is. We don't have to do any guessing here. I really like that, right? And then, uh, it says it's fiery red. Could this be an allusion to the persecution and the misery and the martyrdom caused by Satan through his agents down through time? Right? I think so. Bloody shit. Bloody red or fiery red. Now, I didn't mean bloody the way the English do. Okay. Just want to make sure I wasn't cussing. <laughs> You know, the English, they, they use the word bloody as a cuss word, right? So I wanted to make sure we have uh, our distinguished uh, bit, uh, uh, church member over there from England. I wanted to make sure she knew I wasn't cussing. I didn't realize bloody was a cuss word in England. <laughs> yeah, isn't that right? Is that right, Barbara? Bloody is a cuss word in England, right? Oh, Lord. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so be careful. You go to England, don't be saying bloody, okay? <laughs> They're going to look at you like what, you, profanity. Uh-huh. I mean, so rarely use it. <laughs> every third word, I think. Every third word, huh? Yeah. Uh, so, we have this dragon represented as having seven heads. Um, I think it's interesting how the Old Testament speaks about this. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. Can somebody read that one, please? You say Isaiah 9, 15? Yes. Uh, what, wait a second. We're going to go to Isaiah 9, 15. Let's, let's do that in verse 4, though. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 27 first. Isaiah chapter 27. Notice how what it says in verse 1. Can somebody read that? I do want somebody to read Isaiah 9 15 here in just a couple of minutes. But let's do uh, Isaiah 27 1 first. <clears throat> in that day, the Lord with his sore and great and sore, strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. It's interesting how it equates serpent, dragon, and leviathan all together here. 
And it was known to them, and of course in our culture we, we haven't studied Canaanite myth, mythology, but they knew that this Leviathan in this context, because in Job, Leviathan was a real animal, right? But here, it's symbolic of Canaanite mythology. They had a seven-headed snake in their mythology, okay? And so and he's referring to that as being really Satan. And um, I think it's interesting how we have John, who also knew about Canaanite mythology, uh, he's making a reference here. He's using the same type of symbolic meaning in Revelation chapter 12. We have a seven-headed dragon. And uh, can you tell me what the seven heads, you said diadems, right? Or on each head? A diadem is only for royalty, right? Okay. Two different crowns in the New Testament, right? What's the first crown that all of us have as victorious Christians called? The yeah. Stephanos. 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 Stephanos yeah, right? Stephanos, yeah. So see, so two different Greek words in the New Testament are translated as crown. Stephanos, which is like a wreath, you know, a victory, right? Can be translated as crown. But here we have actually diadem can be translated as a crown. And that means royalty. Okay? So here we have these seven heads that have these diadems on them, right? These okay. crowns. Kingdoms. Like kingdoms. That's exactly right. Thank you, Wanda. So we're talking about kingdoms here. So tell me who the seven heads are. France. What's Daniel chapter 2? And Daniel <coughs> chapter 7. What do they say the first one is? Babylon. 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 What's the next one? Persia. Okay. So it first started out as Medes and Persians and then became Persia, right? Persians. Greece. 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 At, in Daniel 7 as a Leo card. What? Which wrong? Uh, pagan wrong. Pagan. I'll say Roman Empire. Roman okay? Empire, yeah. So we have four of the heads there, and I think what it's showing here, these are nations or political entities that Satan used right down through time. He used these political entities, okay? And so we see here the Roman Empire, uh, as you notice, it was the Romans who actually physically nailed Jesus to the cross, right? Ultimately, the Roman Empire... Uh, persecuted the early Christian church. You got to stamp them out. See, the devil was using these entities in order to persecute God's people. And I think that's what we see here. Now, as we go forward and look at these other heads, we'll see in Revelation chapter 17, the heads represent mountains on which the woman sits, but they also represent kingdoms. Right? Isn't that what it says in Revelation chapter 17? Yeah. Right? And so, uh, I wonder who these next three are going to be. Wouldn't papal, papal be one of them? Okay, you're saying the papacy. The papal wrong. Okay, maybe as the fifth head. Because mm -hmm. it is, it's a political entity, right? It's the world's smallest, I think it's the world's smallest kingdom or nation. But it's also a church, right? Smallest nation, largest church. Okay? And we'll get to the other two when we get to Revelation chapter 17. But I think we see that these seven heads represent the uh, different kingdoms that Satan has used down through time. And of course, we have the ten horns there. We know the ten horns came out of the Roman Empire here, right? So I think we can't get away from what God already gave us in Daniel to help us understand Revelation, right? If you get away from it, then you can come up with all different type of translations and interpretations, right? And it just doesn't make sense, right? I think we got to stay with what the Bible gave us in the Old Testament. Now, I don't think we should get away from that, trans that interpretation, that is. Okay. Okay. Um, I want you to notice, where are the diadems located? 
on the heads. Right. When we get to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, where are uh, the crowns located? Horns. On the horns. All right? So you're looking at different phases of the same entity. Okay? Mm. So this is a previous phase. And um, we'll go forward. When it says in verse 4, we get into the great controversy. It says, His tail. Who's the his? Satan. Yes, referring to Satan. You know that from verse 9, right? His tail drew a third of the stars. So, notice what a tail represents in the Bible. Um, it's interesting, and this is Isaiah 9 15. Now, does somebody already look that up? Yeah. <laughs> the ancient and honorable, he is the head. The prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. The prophet that, that teaches, teaches lies, lies, he is the tail. You know, what do we call a lie? See, uh, we call it a tail. <laughs> a tail. <laughs> right? A tall tail. <laughs> yeah, we just spell it a little differently, Mike, right? But it's a tail. <laughs> Where do we get that from? <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Right? And so we have this idea of this is a religious person who speaks lies about God. This is what we're talking about. How in the world did Satan deceive a third of the stars? Mm. He had to tell lies, lies. right? Mm -hmm. And if you'd never heard a lie before, <coughs> you'd say, hey, what, what are you talking about? What's going on here? You know? You know what I mean? Wouldn't you do that? You'd never heard a lie before. I don't know how old these angels were that bought into his lies. But they looked up to, to Lucifer, you know. What Lucifer was a beautiful, bright, shining angel who was head over the other angels. He's a cherub that covered. He, he, yeah. I think we need to look some verses up here. Why don't we go to I, I mean Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight and notice we'll start there in verse twelve. You remember how we said here Satan has worked through empires. He's worked through individuals. He's always behind the scene. It's not because he doesn't want to be in front. I think God said, no, you can't, you can't reveal yourself yet. I think he holds him back. So he has to work through other agencies and people. So notice in Ezekiel chapter 28, notice how the verse in verse 12 starts out. Son of man, take up women and take from home the king of Tyrus. Saying to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So, was the king of Tyre uh, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty? No. No. He's, re he's saying, you know, he's not really addressing it to the king of Tyre, he's addressing it to the entity behind the king of Tyre, right? And it's Satan. And notice we know that because let's read verses 13 to 15 now. Who's got that? You've got, to read, you've got to use your preaching voice so Bill can hear you, hear you on the uh, iPad here. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes, which prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art of the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. So <coughs> iniquity was found in thee. God created a perfect being called Lucifer, which means bright shining one or sun of the morning or, you know, or star of the morning. Right? Sun of the morning, sun's a star. Okay? And so, uh, Lucifer was created perfect. Notice how it said that. He was perfect, full of wisdom. He was beautiful. He was, this is the way God created Lucifer. He didn't create, God didn't create Satan. He didn't create the devil. He created a beautiful angel called Lucifer. And he says he's the uh, cherub, right? That covers. What does that mean? Look in Psalm 99 verse 1. What's it say there? <laughs> Thank you. 
The Lord. Go ahead. No, go ahead. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. What's interesting is Psalms 80, verse 1. If you wanted to write that in your Bible next to Psalm 99, 1 talks about the same thing. He had this position next to God. So not only was he he was perfect, this beautiful created being called Lucifer, but he had a position that was next to God. I and mean, he couldn't have a higher position as a created being. Right? And unfortunately, he coveted, didn't he? Christ's position in heaven. And it says here, in Isaiah chapter 14, we have his plan. We have his thinking. We have his thoughts. God gave us Satan's thoughts here in Isaiah chapter 14, 12 to 14. If we could have somebody read that passage, please. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. How many eyes did you get in there? Yeah, I think there, did, did I count on eye? You got five yeah, eyes? Five, yeah, five, yeah. You know, uh, I think we've got this idea that he was very self-centered <clears throat> because he chose, it's called the mystery of iniquity, to rebel against God. Oh, we live in a perfect society, right? Let's say we live in a perfect place. There's no death, there's no misery, there's no pain, there's no suffering. Everybody's got a smile on their face every day. Right? Sounds like heaven. Yeah, it, it sounds just like heaven, doesn't it? <laughs> and I come to you and say, Owen, we can have a better existence. Let's rebel. What would you say to me? You lost. <laughs> <laughs> and two-thirds of the angels, right, said get lost. But the Bible says that one-third believed his lies. And that's what's sad. A third of the angels bought into this. Where do we have this idea that, that stars represent angels? We're back in Revelation 1. Verse 20. Revelation 1, verse 20. Notice what it says there. And we're showing when it says in Revelation 12, verse 4, that a third of the stars were deceived by the tales of Satan, the lies. Notice what it says in Revelation 1.20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, so we have this idea that stars represent angels in the book of Revelation, right? But let's make sure we're applying it appropriately to this context. Notice what it says in Revelation 12, verse 9. Okay? So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Okay, that's the lies. He was cast to the earth, and his angels, the Bible is interpreting the term stars for us, isn't it? As angels now, were cast out with him. So we have this idea that angels are represented by stars here in the book of Revelation. I think it's pretty straightforward and clear. What do you think? It's just sad to think that he was able to come along and convince them that even though everything was perfect. Yeah, I just don't know how he did it. I mean, it just... It'd be amazing to me. Well, let's no, see. How does yeah, he do it? Yeah, yeah it's it's kind of, kind of, at its root is still going to be more power. You know, all the you know kind of the threefold. What's the worst thing that can ever happen to you as a human? As much power as you can possibly have, right? So, which is the the big thing? Hey, if you come to my kingdom, you're going to be. Even the disciples wanted to be rulers there. Right. So you, right. If, I, if I tell you, hey, I give you a million dollars. Come and do it, by the way. 
Very few people turn that down. Yeah. When yeah. what the root that you are, and it doesn't matter what the sin is, the root that you're offering isn't sinful. And the angels couldn't see this the end result. The connection, right? That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. You can't see the end result. And Lucifer, this is the thing. This is, it's, and we always go back to blaming God. You made him. Why would you make him to deceive me? What were you thinking? You know, it's the same, yeah. same thing that Eve said to Adam, you know. Uh, it will. You know, I mean, they both blame, everyone's blaming God. It's always Adam, God's Adam fault. said, the woman that you gave me, you know. <laughs> the woman. Right? And then she said, the serpent, the serpent that you that, made. That you made. That's what that is. <laughs> you know, trying to, you know, the accountability thing. And that's how Satan can get him, though, is he just, you just offer him a deal that you, I mean, yeah, man, that's better. That just seems better. And to the selfish. There's a part of us that's selfish. I don't know. That's the part I'm, I'm not sure about because the angels were made perfect. So I don't think that they had that broken nature. So that part of it, boy, Satan's got to be good. And I, you know, and I think too that Satan, there's a part of him that must think that he's right. He is. He has that justified resentment thing going on in spades. So I, and the reason why I think, and I think Steve, you're right on track. The reason why I think he could deceive them is notice how he deceived Eve. Yeah. Right? He is using this <clears throat> serpent, right? And you know... Most beautiful thing ever made. Not like it is now. Run around, run around. I think we got to look up a verse to... to, <laughs> to I, I think you're right. Notice that a serpent wasn't what we see today. No. Exactly. Uh, I think we could probably show this. Let me see if I can... Uh, I got the verse right in my mind here. Let's see. Notice verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 30. This is really a, a, a very interesting chapter to help us understand what's going on here, how he could deceive these angels. And it says in verse 6, The burden against the beasts of the south, through a land of trouble and anguish, from which came the lioness and lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. Mm. Notice the, one of the characteristics of a serpent. Fine. Why does he look fiery? Because he glistened in the sunlight as he flew along. We were talking about how beautiful he was created, right? God had created a, an animal referred to here as a serpent that was a beautiful creature at one time, right? That could fly. And so that's why here it is up in the tree, you know, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he was warned not to go near. So she gets close, and she sees this serpent talking, you know. How can an animal talk? Right. Right? And so the animal Well, how claims, could it talk without God being behind it? You see yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was watching, she, she blamed, hey, you made this thing. It's the thing that deceived me. I'm just being a good girl, trying to, you know. Yeah, you know, of course, the very first thing she did that she shouldn't have done was she was Suffer. told not to leave Adam's side. Right. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> and she did and so, you know I don't know what happened exactly but here she is she's in front of this the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you know and she sees this talking animal how can it talk well it claims it can talk because it partook of the fruit that God said you shouldn't have you see the reason why God said you shouldn't have it this is the devil talking to Eve now the reason why God said you shouldn't have it because he knew once you partake of it, you'll be on a higher plane. Your mind will be expanded. You'll have a higher existence. And God's trying to hold back. You see, he's trying to hold you back from what you deserve. Exactly what he was Satan was trying to do in heaven, trying to get up there. And that's what he told the angels in heaven. Too. God's trying to hold you back. Better way. There's a better way. You know, God's keeping it secret. More exalted. Yeah. More awesome. Well, so, first, don't, we, don't we buy the same thing? Oh, my, everything. Didn't he, didn't he start out by saying, there's a law? You know, because they didn't know there was a law. And he starts saying, he brought that out to make it, right. make it suspicious. Part of his attack of God's government was his law. 
because that's the foundation of God's government. We have the same attack going on today, don't we? We have the same arguments going on today. Why do we ever partake in sin? Why? Why do we dip our toe over there knowing it's not good for us? Because it's pleasurable. Yeah. Do, have we bought into the same lie yeah. that he bought into, that these angels bought into? If I do this, I'm going to be happier. If I do this, I'm going to be satisfied. If I do this, it's going to make something better in me. Exactly. Right? Why do we buy into the same lie? Because you think it's making your life better. You exactly. He That's makes why. you think that. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. You should yeah. take ice cream, for example. Yeah. Exactly. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey. <laughs> How much ice cream? You know, you got a five gallon thing of it there in front of you, right? Your favorite kind. At what point do you enter sin as you're eating it? Is it one or two or is it, you know what I mean? And at some point, man, you're going into gluttony. At some point. Well, I, I think if you're eating five gallons at one time, no, 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 you're not. Gluttony, right? you, you, you're just going to have the I proper amount. We the just have a half enough. gallon, Steve. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tina. Well, I have a question. So we're born into sin. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what happens when we sin? Do we just get to keep doing it? Yes. Or do we have to repent? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. But the, an- the angels I know. were created. Sinless. Yeah. 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 So was it a character flaw? So was Eve. Did they have that? Yeah. yeah. I- do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, yeah it's God's fault. I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Y'all stop grabbing away from Steve. Okay. We may have some lightning to do. I'm no. telling you. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not God's fault, no. is it? No. It's, it's freedom, freedom of choice. Yeah. Freedom of choice. Yeah, exactly. And that's what the angels had, too. They had free will to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Free will. That's what's going right. on. And you can choose... Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Satan's philosophy in life? Are you going to go along with Christ's philosophy in life? Right? So we are at a disadvantage, yes. right? Isn't it amazing that here you have angels that have never sinned, didn't have a propensity to sin, and choose, and they chose to rebel against Christ, right? Yes, that's, that, that's it. Scott? The Bible calls it the mystery of the mystery. Because if we, if we could explain it, we could excuse it. That's what Ellen White says. And we can't explain it. No, and it would cease to become sin. Then. If right. it could be explained right. rationally, it would cease to be. Right, exactly. And if you notice from what we read in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, it says he wanted to have his throne above the stars of God. Yes. He wanted to be over all the angels. Who was already over all the angels? Jesus. Jesus was already over all the angels, right? So you see the great controversy is between Christ and Satan. He specifically attacked Christ's vision. It's the second person of the Godhead. You know? He specifically attacked Christ's position. He he coveted Christ's position. And we're told by Ellen White that Lucifer was made most to even look like or be similar to Christ. He was made that way. Or maybe better looking. He thought he was. Of course, he thought he was, you know. Mm -hmm. Better looking. You may be this way. in heaven, he's like, whoa, look at me. Yeah, Yeah. seriously. This is awesome. He's got all these stones and stuff on him. I don't know what the world is. Well, I'd be grateful to be near me. Yeah, Yeah, that that was his attitude, wasn't it? We see that in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 16 and 17. So he was attacking specifically Christ's position in heaven. And so we have this war in heaven going on, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. The mystery of iniquity takes place. You know, like you're saying, it doesn't make sense, right? And there's no excuse in the Bible for sin, right? Uh, well, it's going to end in your demise forevermore. Yeah. What kind of a... You know, you're trading pleasure or whatever power or whatever to be then be gone and wiped off for all time. That and that's sense. what we have to, that's one of the reasons why it's important to keep reading the Bible every day, because it reminds us how bad sin is yeah. and the end result, yeah. right? Because yeah. we tend to forget. You know, I'll indulge over here just a little bit. I'm just taking a toe. You know, I'm not stepping right in it, you know, just a toe, right? Yeah, right. A toe's not going to hurt me. I'll come right back and ask forgiveness, right? right? You know, but what happens is, 
Uh, we forget how horrible sin is. Look what sin did to Jesus. Right? We're at this that time of the year. The suffering that he went through for us should show us how horrible sin really is. Yeah. Right? You know, we're told to study the life of Christ an hour a day, mainly around the cross. Yeah, especially the closing scenes. Yeah, exactly. That's what she tells us to do. You're right. Say it again. We should we should study Christ's life an hour a day, especially the closing scenes. That's what she said. I think Jeremy read that out of the Desire of Ages last night during our uh, Agape Feast. Well, he's yeah. revealing there the true consequences of sin. And it yeah. doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You, you think it's this, but no, no, no. Eternal separation from God. That's the end result. So give me a verse out of the Bible that proves there's no excuse for sin in the Bible. No excuse for sin. Give me a verse. Because you hear people say, you know, you go share the truth about the Sabbath, you show that uh, disobeying the Ten Commandments is sin, and people say, oh, well, you can't, you can't go without sinning anyway. They bought into the lie, you see. Yeah. If somebody says, oh, you can't live without, you can't live without sinning, that's the, that's the argument Satan's making. Yeah. Right? That's what he says. Yeah, I think so. That's it. I love that verse. That's a great verse. First Corinthians chapter ten and verse thirteen. What's it say, John? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as the common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, and you may be able to bear it. So have you ever did this, Bruce? Get tempted to sin? And you, you ever said, God, I'm looking for the way of escape. Where's it at? I don't want to jump. I'm tempted. Give me, show me the way of escape. Right? Have you done that? It might be a good thing to do. Yeah. First Corinthians 10, 13. Every person in this room ought to have that verse memorized. Okay? Because when you are tempted to sin and you think... I desire this so much, I can't hold back. You need to be saying, <coughs> quoting 1 Corinthians 10, 13, right? No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So we should be looking for the way of escape when we're tempted beyond what we think we're able to handle, right? I think it's a good opportunity for us to do that. Is that what that saying says, friend? God won't give you more than you can bear? I think so. I think so. Yep, good point, Tina. All right, any questions? We're in verse 4, and we've covered the first half of it. Any other questions about verse 4? first half. Okay? What do we answer your question, Mark? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're okay there? Yeah. We're that an awesome good. idea? And all? Okay. Yeah. It goes on to say, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Alright, you remember, here's, here's, the, here's the, the quiz, the test. I put five kingdoms up on this board. And I made a mention about one of those kingdoms was during the time of Christ, right? And when it says here, the dragon stood before the woman and was ready to, who was ready to give birth to devour her child. Is child capitalized in your verse? <clears throat> He's talking about Jesus, isn't it? All right. How did the dragon stand before the woman to devour her child? What what? In reality, took place historically. Okay, what did he do? He had all the children two years of age to kill. He did. And what type of soldiers did he send to kill those babies? Roman soldiers. Do you see when it says, "And the dragon stood before the woman"? It means Satan used pagan Rome to try to kill Christ as a baby. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Because if you understand that, then when we get to Revelation chapter 13, it's going to be much easier to understand. Okay? 
And you uh, refreshed our memory with a story there of how he tried to kill all the babies because he felt threatened by a king being born. And so Satan was trying to use Herod and the Roman authorities, the Roman soldiers, to kill Christ. And I believe that's what Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, part B is talking about, is this attempt to kill Christ when he was a baby. It's interesting that it was two years and then under, so it must have taken the wise men two years from the time they saw this because he based it on what they told him. Yeah, I think they saw the star, and they're in the east, right? And they're like, oh, we're going to take a trip. <clears throat> but we got to get ready for this trip. Okay, so they had to get ready for the trip, then they took off, and they only traveled by night, but they wanted to follow the star. So I did think it took some time. <clears throat> good point. Yeah, good point. All right, it says in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations. Well, that's a huge hint. That's what we're talking about. What's it say in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9? Right? Psalm 2, 8 and 9? Anybody want to read that? <clears throat> to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Where does that phrase come from? Notice what it says in Psalm 2, 8 and 9. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen in the second coming. Oh my. <laughs> right? So we know it's talking about Jesus here. Um, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, as we'll see in Revelation chapter 19. That's one of his titles. And uh, we know that his kingdom has no end, right? Can you all think of a verse in the Bible that says his kingdom has no end? Are you racking your brain? Did anybody think of Luke chapter 1? Yeah, that was it. That was it, Tina? Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right. Uh, use your beepers and do a little scan in Luke chapter 1. Is that a medical term, peepers? I, you know, <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. It's not. And uh, see if you come up with a verse. You know, the verse is going to start with a three, but it's not verse three. Thirty-three. <laughs> Thirty-three. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom, there shall be no, no end. end. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that the same as Daniel 2.44? Yes. Does that not talk about Christ's kingdom? Hebrews destroying the statue and having no end. Hebrews 1.8 is where God the Father calls God the Son God. Right? So his kingdom has no end. I want to be a part of kingdom that has no end. Yes. How about you? I am all right. right. Yes. And I, you know, Philippians chapter 3 says our citizenship is in heaven. in heaven, right? It's in heaven. And so I think we live like our citizenship is in heaven. Exactly right. Right? Yes. We are about Christ's kingdom. And I love what it says whenever Jesus was talking here in Matthew. And this is pretty phenomenal here. We don't have time to go through all the details, but... He says in Matthew chapter 16 about his kingdom. I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. So why does hell have gates? Right? Hell has gates because Satan is trying to keep people in his kingdom. You remember what happened in Berlin... You know, not too long after World War II, but, you know, about around 1960, 61, they built a wall, right, separating Berlin from the, uh, the communist part of it, right? They didn't want people escaping over to West Berlin. And so they built a wall, not to protect them, but to keep them in. Satan has a wall. And he has gates to keep people in his kingdom. And when you're living a life that is centered on this, 
self and sin, then you are part of, Christ, of, of Satan's kingdom, and Christ wants you to be delivered from his kingdom. That's why he says the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, the gospel is going to penetrate into Satan's kingdom and save people. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. He says, bring my children out of Babylon, too. He does say that. Babylon's religious confusion. And that's what we have the call in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people. And so, I think it's cool. Now, you don't have to stress about this idea of uh, can I be ready for Christ's second coming? Can I be saved? Right? Because Christ's kingdom is the type of kingdom that is, is forward-looking. It's aggressive toward Satan's kingdom. It's conquering Satan's kingdom. And the gospel will save you from Satan's ideology and selfishness, Lies. right? And will prepare you for the second coming. I think it's pretty cool if we'll just allow Christ to save us from, from Satan's kingdom. Don't you want that? Yeah. Right? Can you save yourself? Absolutely not. What does it say again in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9? <clears throat> not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works. Not of works. That any man should boast. Lest any man should boast. You see? Why not allow God to save us? Well, unmask the lies. That's it. He does. Because when we read the Bible, our eyes are being opened to the truth. And that's what sets you free. Amen. From the thing. That's why Jesus said the truth shall make you free. Right? Because you realize, if I could take a 12-year-old who is just learning to smoke cigarettes, take him in to my patients that, you know, I mean, it's so sad. Okay, yeah. and let him see that, well, this is, you doing this is going to cause this. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, then I won't have that. Right. So you right. better unmask the lies that Satan tells us on every yeah, absolutely. On That's every. what the gospel does, doesn't it? Exactly. Right. It unmasks the lies. Yeah. And the Holy so. Spirit in you can tell you, don't do this. <clears throat> Amen. So, I think we could start in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 next time. Is that a good place to start? Yeah. Father in heaven, we humbly pray to you and ask that Jesus come into our lives and save us. Unmask the deceptions that we bought into. Amen. Save us from our sins. Yeah. Help us be a part of Christ's kingdom. Please cast any demons out of us yeah. and away from us and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Jesus. We want to be a part of your kingdom, not only today but forever. So please save us. We put all, all our trust in you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.